Hello, everybody. Uh, we are live from Los Angeles and the old country. Uh, and I'm here with my friend, El Profesor, or El Famoso Profesor, who is uh, actually an expert in economics and someone who has been involved as an insider with the Swiss watch industry for decades on end now. So whenever I, your host here, Young Brando, want to talk about the watch market with some added insight beyond my experience as a collector, uh, as an enthusiast, and my own gut feelings um, and intellectual propensities uh, as an analyst, I bring in my friend here. How are you doing, Professor? Oh, very good. Uh, thank you. Thank you for inviting me. I, you know, more recently we had you uh, kind of with a random, uh, unexpected appearance where you even gave us a Gonzo stream from the heart of a certain European capital. I, I really enjoyed that. But, you know, our more programmed and structured conversations I even enjoy more. Um, and today we are going to talk about the Morgan Stanley report. Uh, they have kind of a punny name that goes with it. This is the seventh time they are doing it. So it's the seventh annual Swiss watcher. They must have really thought hard, long and hard about that last part, Swiss watcher. That's it's great, very smart. Um, and it really focuses on, on a couple of tendencies, on a couple of trends in the Swiss watch market that have become more or less <clears throat> trends that we have been following since we started covering uh, the reports <clears throat> by these famous financial consulting companies like Morgan Stanley, like Deloitte, on the Swiss watch industry on this channel. Uh, one of the key aspects of the report is uh, the increasing and intensifying polarization and premiumization of the market. That is just a very handy way of saying that for, first of all, the so-called big four, the big four independently owned watch manufacturers, Rolex, Patek Philippe, Audemars Piguet, and Richard Mill have a kind of desirability, have an aspirational quality that has reached a fever pitch that remains at an all-time high. And that's when you combine, for example, uh, brands like Rolex, Cartier, uh, Patek Philippe, and Richard Mille, you have basically sales that amount to slightly more than uh, half of the entire Swiss watch industry. So premium, premiumization means increased uh, and intensified interest on brands that stand at the top of the pyramid, such as the names we mentioned, the so-called big four. It also means that watches that are that have a tag price that is 12,000 Swiss francs and above, even 25,000 Swiss francs and above, have been uh, more and more occupying an increased share in the sales and revenues. And perhaps the easiest demonstration of that, which, which is something that I would uh, also like to talk with the professor, is how the industry has grown even as it 
continued to shrunk, uh, shrink in a way. Um, and I know I'm being uh, obviously a little playful, playful here, but when you look at the number of units sold, in 2011, there were almost 30 million Swiss watches sold, 24 million of them being quartz, and about 6 million of them being mechanical. Today, uh, there are about 17 million, of which you have 6.3 mechanical and 10.6 Quartz. So in terms of the sheer number of watches sold, you might get the impression that, yes, smart watches have been cannibalizing a certain portion of the market, the sales are dropping, but premiumization means that the revenues generated by the industry have reached an all-time high, which stands at about... Um, 30 about 30 billion dollars at the wholesale level and 50 sorry 30 billion swiss francs at the wholesale level and 50 billion at the retail level excluding the vat so in fact the number of mechanical watches that have been exported that have been sold from out of switzerland remained more or less the same but the intensified attention to the premium brands and to their more expensive and one might say hype watches has meant that the industry has grown, uh, you might say, disproportionately over the last decade and, of course, over the last few years, as many have observed. Maybe this can be a good point to start our discussion, Professor. First of all, what do you think about, about that trend uh, of polarization and premiumization? Do you see a way out of it? Or is this really how you see the Swiss watch industry to grow and develop for some time to come? Yeah. Uh, thank you. Um for this and thank you again for the invitation um let me say you know the the first issue is that 2023 was a peculiar year because uh there are certain things happening in the watch industry and certain things happening outside the industry which impacts uh the way consumers behave and the way the watch industry is behaving and again, the watch industry is a very dynamic uh, participant in all this. They're not oblivious to what is happening outside. And 2023 was a very difficult year in general as economic growth subsided. And of course, the big participants in this, um, mainly the East Asian countries, and within that, uh, China had an impact in the way uh, impacted the way it's behaving and it impacted the wider um, uh, consumer consumerism that we witnessed and as a result watches have have been affected now you might say but but why uh, professor do we see still solid demand which is the case in 2023 and um, we see demand in the watch industry in particular, as you described, even in this kind of more difficult economic climate, easy money has come to an end. We will not go back to easy money for the next you know, decade or so, uh, meaning free money, nearly zero interest rates and, and so forth, um, and printing money and uh, frenziness in, in everything else. Um, we're still seeing some frenziness, but we will get into the particulars. So how come this is uh, still, you're telling us that the global economy has subsided in terms of growth, but yet you see high demand in watches. 
And I think there there is the what we call the tail effect um, in in the watch market, meaning that uh, the wider public is still mesmerized by the watch industry. Those participants who were not partaking in purchases of watches, um, they are partaking in 23 as these pieces became more available. So what we call the tail effect means that there is still demand on the back of this um, bubble that was formed uh, from roughly 2018-2019 with its height um, in the pandemic era and immediately thereafter. So we still see tail effects. People buy watches, but definitely the demand has subsided, but that's enough to carry and create um, higher growth on sales for many of these companies. Now, polarization has been happening for many years. I mean, Rolex, um, has dominated forever the watch industry. And it, it is not an exaggeration to refer to them as the crown. I mean, they are the most important mover. Um, and everybody else is following, and they're following because of, you know, individual strategies, um, uh, people's choices, and so forth. So I think this is going to continue uh, because the the gap is huge, you know, for the rest of them to follow up. You know, the if you go below below Breitling, uh, the the difficulties that many of these companies are facing are really structural. Um, and if I if I may interject here, actually, you know, Rolex has grown its its yes. market share. Uh, of course. The margin is already quite high, but they they now account in and of themselves. That is to say, without counting Tudor, to more than thirty uh, yes. percent of of revenue in the in the industry. And just to add, like a little bit of footnote to what you were saying earlier, or summarize, you know, that could be comprehended uh, by simpler minds uh, like. I have um, a lot of the growth of the watch market has basically to do with the entrenchment, with the solidification of the idea of a Swiss mechanical watch as a luxury product. So they have been for now in the post quartz era, the Swiss have been hedging their bets. Uh, yes, but largely leaning on the perception of a mechanical watch as a premium luxury good. So they benefit, you know, they, they stand and fall with the fates of the luxury markets. And like you said, the luxury markets has grown significantly in the post pandemic era. And that growth uh, has been reflected uh, in the sales of Swiss watches globally uh, with an export growth of 13 percent uh, from last year yeah what we need to account the growth is also is it organic growth meaning uh, volumetric um, or um, based on price increases which they institute um, at least in 2024 it will be more uh, moderate given that the Swiss industry is realizing that uh, they've done enough of these crazy uh, or steep increases during the uh, energy crisis of 22-23 and uh, the hyper, well, the inflation, the elevated inflation era that we witnessed and we're still witnessing in many countries. So um, you need to account for the price also uh, as well as the volume. Um, for many of these brands, they've done multiple increases. Uh, but this year, I expect that there will be uh, far more moderate. Rolex has done one. They will not do another one for this year. I do want to ask you a question 
um, on that particular fine point uh, with pricing specifically, because on this channel, we have addressed many times how, um, by and large, the trend of the smartwatches taking over the lower, the entry level segments of the luxury watch markets has become a reality that everyone has to contend with. Um, meaning that uh, as and you know as a part of as an aspect of the premiumization we are talking about uh, the brands that have products that largely cater to that price point at or below 3000 swiss francs have lost their market share significantly except of course there is uh, certain gains made by the Swash Group. Um, this is another uh, development that the annual Swiss Watcher highlights or underlines with the PRX line of their brand Tissot and uh, with the Swash collaborations they have made with Omega and Blancpain, but really mostly due to the global sales of the Moon Swatch which may have reached uh, 2 million, supposedly, last year. Um, I don't know the exact numbers, but I've seen this particular figure quoted. Uh, what do you think of that development? And I'm, this is really three questions in one. You can try to answer them all or you know, just pick one. Do you, do you think that is going to last? First of all, why do you think uh, Swatch has actually chosen this particular method of targeting a specific uh, price point of the market that is more between 250 to 500 Swiss francs more than anything? So it's not only below 3K, but well below. Um, because there are other rumors about Swatch Group, which I'm sure you might want to bring up when, when thinking about this. And what do you think it is actually uh, doing? Is it putting a Band-Aid on the kind of losses that a lot of these publicly listed companies are having in that segment of the market? Is it something that they can actually sustain and turn into um a segment that is healthy um and that is even growing for them in the next years i know this is too many questions but essentially i want you to somehow address uh the moon swatch effect so to speak yeah yeah so look uh, here we're talking about a publicly listed company swatch and everything they do is in a way scrutinized and in a way it has to do with shareholder value they care a lot about the price of the stock they care a lot about analysts covering the stock the reason why morgan stanley uh publishes this it's not because they want to talk about rolex uh, but it's because they want to make money from the publicly listed companies whether it's lvmh or Richemont, uh, or uh, Swatch, right? So this is the reason. They're not doing it because they want to talk about Audemars or Rolex. They're finding it a way to discuss the wider industry and the listed companies that they cover and their position on them. So it's not because they are um, philanthropists and they want to help um, young Brando and his audience. So uh, Swatch is a publicly listed company and they need to maximize whatever they have in their hands. And what they have is something that looks like a moon watch, which they can, in a way, bastardize. Okay. I mean, everybody does it in the luxury industry. Let's be realistic. Um, Rolex has maximized the potential of its oyster case. And everybody knows it by that. 
um, the moon watch has been, you know, whether you want to use the in, 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 incorrect, politically incorrect word, bastardized or duplicate, which is the PC word, well, they'll have to maximize what they can on copyrights, patents, and, and so forth. The same is done with Bulgari, with the Gerald Genta line. The same is done with all the others. You know, they try to uh, paint a picture around that. So they, they will maximize it, and, and there will be people, they understand that there are enough people who are willing to pay, whether it's the PRX, which has different colors and variations, for the would-be upper middle class person or middle class person who wants to have kind of value with a plastic mechanism, more or less, right? Um, and uh, something that looks uh, bluish that uh, resembles the unattainable Tiffany of Patek Philippe color or Tiffany blue of Rolex Oyster Perpetual. And they, they, they feel happy because it's all about the psychology. The luxury market is all about unattainability and psychology. They fuck around people's minds. And when the consumer understands this, then they take a step back. But if they really, the consumer understands, knows what is the cost of production, right? They will sit back and reflect, but they don't. And, and they all get into this luxury thing. So without digressing further, the point is, Omega has to and Swatch maximize what they have. Now, I think there are two points here. One is the digitalization of the of the watch industry. The the smart watch will continue, and more and more, I see very very wealthy people who are opting not to wear um, a, a lavish watch and they wear the Apple Watch or other brands. Um, and I see the aspiring middle class, you know, guy who made his first money and typically buys the Rolex, right? Which is the, the, the quite essential kind of watch to buy when you make money at first. But this trend will continue because you know, there will be a market for the Apple Watch. Um, Apple sales will continue to do very well. And especially as they move into the health industry, right? They they become more of a health conscious provider um, as well as, you know, doing all the other stuff. And then you will have the other segment, which it it doesn't negate the fact that you can have one person who has an Apple Watch on the left and on the right, he has some kind of a luxury watch. The luxury industry has been proven to exist, no doubt, right? Um, what is happening is that the publicly listed companies, Richemont, LVMH, Swatch, will try to always maximize because they're scrutinized on that basis by their shareholders, and also they are accountable to their shareholders. Um, now, let, let me let me ask you a question on that mm -hmm. on that point. I think you described the why, you described the reasoning uh, behind the creation of of such models, such accessible products that perhaps presents more attainable um, and you know in a way less risky for the wearer as well alternatives to the luxury products to uh, ones that are truly unattainable from those brands, but also from others. Now, let me ask you, the I think, the more important question for those publicly listed companies, because despite the gains that Swatch has made, and you also mentioned Richemont, they seem to be the ones that are underperforming constantly and that are basically shrinking further. Um, sometimes this is attributed to the over-dependency and over-extension mm. of such group brands in the Chinese market. Uh, I think cool. 
that perhaps doesn't tell the entire story that doesn't tell the whole story you're but right in, in in mid to in mid to long term do you think do you think these sorts of efforts to maximize um and and really squeeze uh, you know the living energy of a lot of their iconic products will benefit them or can it possibly hurt them because it for now it's barely keeping them at that same level otherwise they seem to be sinking the group brands like Richemont like Swatch Group and others yeah so uh again you are you are looking at it on a annual basis mm -hmm. um and uh, some of these brands are impacted in the case of uh, swatch you know longine tissot in the chinese market it has been impacted um but over the medium term um the publicly listed companies will be able and they'll have to be able to turn around the ship now what is also happening in the industry is that we have this bifurcation of of uh, efforts you see as as the industry is moving um with the top three four brands the the others are losing market share because their watches are becoming less desirable i mean everybody under this you know earth um really wants to buy at the beginning maybe one to three brands right more or less and once you buy one or two watches of that of one of these brands you end up buying you know the more uh, expensive brands and we see that in the in the psychology of of the consumer the way they're behaving um, it seems that Swatch in particular is losing because they they don't have, they're not capable to project a luxury brand out of their group that will be able to carry them for long periods of time. And the problem lies with uh, Breguet. Hmm? I think Breguet is, is, a, is a big uh, issue for them. And the market reflects, you know, the, the market tells you a lot, by the way, um, young Brando. Um, Rolex is, is not by chance the premier uh, watch producer. I'm not saying it's the best. Here we're not talking about the best. Um, because all the others, you know, kind of follow in the same category. Um, but here the, the, the issue is that Swatch in particular has not been able to to bring itself up um, with a luxury, high-end luxury brand. So it is Omega that carries a lot. Um, Longines and Tissot helped them for a while, but now there is a cyclical problem with the Asian market and other markets in particular. So it doesn't have, you know, the, the thing that will make the difference. On the other hand, Richemont um, um, does have an excellent brand which is Vacheron, uh, which is doing well, but it's not enough to carry them to the level of, you know, um, premiership um, and, and compete in volume. Of course, structurally, the problem is that you cannot expand Vacheron and Audemars beyond where they are because you cannot find the watchmakers and so forth and all of these things. Um, and, uh, and, and I think that's really the, the issue. LVMH is a, is a different animal, uh, because LVMH, um, has the tendency to create more noise than, than, than volumes. Um, um, so I, I want to keep it there before I confuse everybody. Thank you, professor. I, I see that you are. You know, you you are always reining in that 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 professorial mind a little bit. You know, putting some restraints on it because I know that you can deliver an entire 
hour-long lecture on this on your own. So I'm just trying to, uh, you know, make it a little more more conversational. Uh, yeah, yeah, Vashon, no, of course. Vashon was, all, of course, one of the brands that they highlighted in this report um, in constituting something of a billionaire's club, right, which now has eight members out of 350-some watch brands from Switzerland. Now, Vachon joins Rolex, Cartier, Omega, Audemars Piguet, Patek Philippe, uh, Richard Mille, and Longines in terms of a turnover that exceeds 1 billion Swiss francs. So that has been a very positive development for Richemont overall. Uh, that means that at least in short to midterm, the gains that have been made uh, by Vacheron uh, in terms of somewhat penetrating into the horological mainstream have not been for naught and are here to stay for, for at least a little bit longer. But there is, a, you know, again, there's always the question of, of how, how sustainable this is um, in, in terms of the kind of rumblings I continue to hear about pricing strategies of, of certain uh, brands. And I will, I will just make a very quick analogy that doesn't have much to do with scale, pricing, and marketing segments, but in the way that these numbers sometimes reflect uh, the, the kind of affective consciousness of the market. For example, Tudor has been the great success story of, of the last decade, right? From simply being the understudy of Rolex, the younger sibling of Rolex, an entry level, an access point to <clears throat> Rolex, Tudor has built a brand that obviously shares uh, that heritage, but also learned to stand on, on its own feet. And over the last couple of years, it has started to become kind of a victim of this success in the sense that people have been complaining quite a lot about how they have somehow become repetitive and stale. And even though there is the occasional release that seems to be a crowd pleaser, like the Black Bay 54, for example, mm -hmm. most mm -hmm. of it remains quite humdrum. Um, yes. and, and we see this year, for example, that they have lost some market share, even though they have uh, actually uh, performed better with uh, um, compared to a brand that yeah. remains their direct competitor, which is uh, Tag Hoya, for example. Uh, so in the same way, right, I have been hearing now at least for two years, perhaps longer, because I am, you know, I belong to a tribe where we uh, love complaining to begin with, but also complaining about price hikes specifically. Um, but at least for the last two years, uh, at least in the post-pandemic era, it seems that these so-called annual price increases have become biannual um, and sometimes even uh, reach the number of four or even half a dozen increases with brands like uh, Omega leading the pack, but also Vacheron, IWC, and Jeje Le Coutre being also similar culprits, right? Uh, we, were, we were thinking about um, like the Polaris Perpetual Calendar, for example, which was when it was first released, priced at around $25,000. That was only two years ago. And now the list price has gone up to 35000 and more, like, you know, right above 35, almost 50% <laughs> price increase in the last two years. And Vachon has been guilty of this as well. Um, do you think they're losing touch a little bit uh, with their consumer base? 
maybe riding the wave of the so-called premiumization a little too hard because like you said yes they are publicly traded yes they need to mine the bottom line and maximize their profits but does that risk alienating their traditional customer base a little bit memovox thank you so much for these 50 beautiful danish crowns thank you for your support yeah so let, let me start from something you you said. The word you said is repetitive uh, in reference to Tudor. Um, I think it's repetitive for a lot of brands. Uh, let's not uh, forget that. I mean, we're kidding if we look at Rolex and we see it as being uh, brand new. I mean, it is the same thing over and over again with a lot of branding, marketing, and groupthink. You know, a lot of the social media and YouTube are copying each other. I listen to you, then you listen to me, and we all listen to each other, and we all follow the herd. I mean, there is very much in luxury herd mentality together with the scarcity element. On the issue of Vacheron, um, Vacheron has um, two things. One is that it over relied on the Chinese market, right? If you look at their sales for 2023 uh, and previously, half of their watches went to China. And I think the CEO and the leadership there wants to change that. So less reliance. The other issue with Vacheron is that they're not yet perceived, although I have a different opinion, um, at par to Patek. Patek is still seen, seen as <clears throat> the of the Holy Trinity. Uh, Patek is at the very top, Vacheron is there, and Audemars is, is, is actually above Vacheron. In my opinion, um, if you allow me, Vacheron is of the three brands above, um, um, and they're above Patek and above uh, Audemars. Audemars is a one-trick pony. I mean, the, it, it, that's a very clear, you know, repetitive kind of production. And, and the Swiss are very conservative when it comes to that. F forget the independence and, you know, the minute players who are, who are there to maybe play with, with uh, more colorful and interesting displays. But yet you pay, you pay a lot and, and dearly for what they're producing. Now, they are opportunists, a young Brando, these watch manufacturers. They looked at an opportunity, they took it. The market was permitting huge increases. One, because there was huge demand, right? And remember, it was in your channel, I used to say over and over again, there will be a time where the day date will be discounted. Maybe not at your AD, but in the gray market, brand new day dates and gold Samariners are selling 25% below list. I mean, back two years ago, had when I said that, people thought I'm, I'm just a crazy professor, but th that's okay. So I, I think um, demand uh, was there and there was limited supply, right? Um, Vachero is not going to increase beyond its 35, 36,000 because they, they have seen such cyclicality, the downturn and the uptrend, right? Uh, Patek is now producing 80,000 pieces, so and so forth. But they saw the demand and also everybody was facing a, a crisis of uh, price increases, the energy crisis, and um, they took an opportunity. Food prices went up, everything went up, services went up. And so they they did, they did um, some did more than others. And now, of course, you're saying, but what about us? Um, uh, if, if you ask who are the people buying the watches, um, I would say only, you know, 25% are really aficionados or connoisseurs, let's say, if I can cast the word widely, what does it mean? Somebody who likes watches, uh, not necessarily streaming 
uh, every every day or every week and talking about watches. That's a different category. But uh, the rest is just very wealthy people or people who made money easy way, hard way, whatever way. And they're there buying watches. And it, the price it, increase is really your and my problem. It's right. not their problem. The, you're absolutely right about that because, again, one side effect or one consequence of, of that almost too holistic integration into the luxury markets uh, is the fact that mechanical watches don't only appeal and are not only desired by, uh, you know, geeky watch enthusiasts like the two of us, but by a wider segment of the population who simply looks at them aspirationally, so to speak, as luxury goods. So the price tag uh, is just one obstacle on the way and not something that uh, they over-intellectualize, um, let's put it in the most <laughs> charitable terms. But I do want to highlight something that you said just to distinguish this platform a little bit. Um, when it comes to most watch channels and live streaming platforms, they are largely run and mostly, if not exclusively, populated by people who have just arrived into the hobby, who have just picked up watch collecting, sometimes literally like yesterday, a lot of times two to three years ago at most. Uh, and that that is the reason that people were looking at you uh, a certain way when you said, hey, the day date specifically and precious metal Rolex watches more widely will be discounted again, sometimes even at the point of retail, but most certainly in terms of how their value is reflected on the actual sales in the secondary market. And you were making that assessment not because you were you know, dreaming up some sort of vision, but it was something based on your previous experience of how precious metal mechanical timepieces have traded over the years, even when they come from prestige okay. brands, even when they come from established value like Rolex on the secondary market vis-a-vis -vis the stainless steel pieces. So the difference of this platform is that it brings together almost in equal measure People who are very new to the hobby, who have just started collecting watches, and people like you who have known this business inside and out for two decades and more as a collector and also as someone who is directly involved um, at a certain level. That, that is the difference, right? That's the kind of perspective and insights someone like you can can have that is quite different from the other uh, talking heads uh, so to speak in in the industry now i will uh in the live streaming space i meant um i want to i do want to ask uh, a, about a couple of brands uh and you know the morgan stanley reports the annual Swiss watcher likes highlighting the performance um, of, of a few brands. Um, but I kind of want, want to hear your take without necessarily that being uh, inflected or uh, shared with uh, what Morgan Stanley has said. Uh, what brand would you highlight as the revelation of last year specifically among Swiss watch manufacturers? Uh, what brand would you highlight positively? Um, and what brand perhaps would you highlight as maybe having a sign of, of a downturn or decline? Um, and why, in, in each case, please? One brand and, and why you think they have been doing so well and, and another brand 
that's perhaps declining and the reasons behind such a downturn. Yeah. So I think that um, the, the, the interesting company, which I don't follow a lot, um, is none other than Richard Mill, which has done exceptionally well, no doubt. But I will be improper and unacademic if I don't mention at the same time Odmar, uh, which has stabilized at its position for three consecutive years. And that is very difficult to do. You know, for a brand that came out of the doldrums, so to speak, in the in the 2000s, you know, um, has done exceptionally well. What I'm surprised is that uh, Patek has been keeping its position and doing exactly what Omega is doing, uh, playing around with repetitive kind of ideas, but doing substantial price hikes, but they don't care. You know, they have also they don't care mentality, which is if you're if you're super wealthy or pretending you're wealthy, uh, you buy our watches um, and there is huge demand. I mean, whoever says that Patek, Audemars and Richard Mille are not in demand and you can pick them up at any point, they're they're only fooling themselves. Um, these are very sought after watches. And believe you me, there are enough people with money. And this is the interesting bit. Um, there are enough people with money who are still buying a lot of watches. And we are just trying to find people like ourselves who um, uh, think that we don't have any more the same liquidity as we had. And, and we're just priced out of the market. Audemars, Patek, Richard Mille is not interested for, for us. Um, they're interested for all these other people. Now, the sad story to this, so this is kind of the, the group of, of success stories. The, the, the ones that I see continuously falling is uh, Gégé Le Coultre. Uh, definitely, they are on a downtrend. And uh, I don't know how they're going to be saved. Um, I think IWC, Hublot, and uh, Panerai uh, seems to be kind of going down. Together with all the anecdotes, the gray market prices that these watches are commanding, whether it's Hublot or JJ, or Panerai, or even if I include in this category, Breguet, I mean, Breguet um, was somewhere there many years ago. Now, if, if you look at uh, 2018, they, they did um, exist. Um, and now they're not to be seen in any of these lists that you have. So Breguet is a real problem, hence, why a lot of their watches are 50 60 percent below retail and and so forth yeah um, i mean i i don't you know we can have that discussion i think on another program um yeah. i don't i wouldn't want to take over uh, this particular conversation but of course you can see that as a problem <coughs> from either end so to speak right you can say prege is becoming a liability for swatch you know, because they are not performing in terms of such sales. On the other hand, um, and perhaps this is again my slanted, uh, you know, enthusiastic and, and nerdy glasses that are tainting or tinting my worldview in a certain way. I would say that actually Swatch Group and their uh, commercial strategies, their corporate outlook is perhaps not serving uh, the needs of a heritage watchmaker like Breguet, which should, um, in my view at least, in fact, 
try to become <clears throat> smaller as it grows, right? And I'm sure people have understood what I've meant. You certainly did. Uh, this would be basically the reflection of, uh, of that collective trend that we have been highlighting of premiumization at uh, the discrete level of, of one manufacturer, right? They should become more and more of a boutique watchmaker, uh, shrink their production, uh, and focus on really honoring that, that legacy of Prege at the, uh, at the finest level possible. And their counterparts, their competitors should be uh, not uh, Longines, not Omega, which are at any rate their sibling brands from, uh, from the same corporate body, but probably independent watchmakers such as uh, F.P. Jean, uh, or even uh, other legacy names such as Ulysse Nardin and Girard Perrago, um, and even Vachon Constantin that we mentioned, which have in fact followed this strategy of really honing and certifying their particular approach to watchmaking to increase the kind of market share they have at the top of the pyramid rather than trying to appeal to everyone else. Okay. Very yeah, good. Yeah, so I mean I we can I, I think we can, you know, we can kind of have that sort of discussion at, separately because we can we can make a similar argument i think about some other brands from within swatch group and even other um, corporate uh, conglomerates and luxury groups uh, and whether they would be better served by a devolution strategy like ulis nardin and girard perago followed from uh, caring um I want to actually pick your mind about, you know, since we have um, about you know, maybe 10 more minutes uh, in this okay. broadcast. Um, I want to ask you about Parmigian et Fleurier and Hermès. Uh, as you know, uh, there have been rumors in the past uh, and rumors that have been publicized uh, in terms of an impending sale um, yeah. of the brand Parmigiani Fleurier and, in fact, the entire vertically integrated system that has been built in the watchmaking town of Fleurier under the patronage of the Sandoz Family Foundation. Um, and of course, that has many moving parts, even beyond the brand itself that has grown uh, out of the proper name of the master watchmaker, Michel Parmigiani, and has seemingly become more profitable recently, which may have actually uh, opened the path for a sale. How Hermes connects to this is, of course, that they have held a 25% stake in Vaucher, which is the movement manufacturer of this system. Uh, they have, in fact, in the past tried to buy that movement manufacturer outright. Do you think they should double down and, and buy Parmigiani from Sandoz Family Foundation? Because they seem to be finally performing positively, if not admirably, uh, especially from the kinds of men's watches they finally managed to actually sell. 
or what other brands, what other watchmakers do you think can realistically buy or should buy Parmigiano e Fleurier uh, and how such a purchase, such a merger might benefit them? Hmm. Uh, I don't know why this is a very, uh, very micro uh, point. Um, I don't know if I'm well equipped to answer this. Um, okay. The the issue is that it's so small in the watch industry that uh, I, I don't think it makes a difference. I mean, okay. I, I I think that's I fair. think that for the for the individual um, uh, shareholders of Parmigiani, I, uh, the point is that over time they have become tired um and they want to do other things but um i i really don't know how to answer that no that that's absolutely fair because again um one of the things that the morgan stanley report does as you know you know they have a, f a literal financial stake in all this because they do provide services for for the brands they cover in these reports uh, speaking of which, uh, Deloitte, you know, who also has uh, their yearly Swiss report, seems to uh, have been chosen uh, to um, represent the seller in this potential sale uh, that involves Parmigiani Fleurier um, from the Sandoz Family Foundation. So, but beyond mm -hmm. that, uh, they also always highlight the more niche aspects of the market. I mean, for example, they say, yes, it is anecdotal. Yes, it only amounts to altogether 2% of the market, but the independent watchmakers that make anywhere from a dozen watches to a thousand units per year have been consistently growing and have a sort of outsized influence uh, on the market uh, that their uh, you know production numbers and their minuscule market share might not necessarily bear out so um, I was basically asking that kind of niche question but if you consider it too too niche I completely understand instead do you have do you have any anything else that you would like to highlight from the reports? or beyond um, in terms of how the watch market looks to you for the rest of 2024. Uh, our friend Robert Taylor, who is a member of the channel, uh, puts the question in the simplest terms. Uh, watch prices in 2024 are going to. Uh, so you can either fill in the blank there or provide us uh, something of a summary outlook of the watch market in 2024 that is more general uh, in scope. So, I mean, as I said, um, one company has already done an increase. Um, I think those that haven't done one, they will do it in 2024, but they will be more modest and moderate in, in price increases in 24. And we see how 25 goes. Um, I think overall, the, the watch market, uh, let's not confuse the watch production and sales versus what people think is happening in the gray market, whether gray market prices have fallen, uh, they're falling, or their perception of a watch as an asset and therefore an investment and they kind of feel oh my god what has happened i mean whoever comes up with excel files and spreadsheets to explain their watches is also erron erroneous because it is unfortunately not an asset <laughs> stop <laughs> it is you're, not an asset you're, you're personally targeting our friend uh, oz I, in the chat really when talk about no no I, I wasn't i wasn't thinking of him I, no, no, I know, I, I know. I'm, I'm I mean, just trying to, uh, you, you know, know because, I like, 
you know i like yeah. instigating uh, between, yeah, for the, between you two you know a lot of people uh, uh on these youtube channels they sit there and they talk about the watch as being an investment and it's an asset and it's a store of value and the value has gone up and now i'm gonna pick up this watch because it has gone down and potentially over the long term um this watch is gonna go up i mean uh people are stupid can i can i make it a little personal uh yes. with you right here uh professor um you know you know the type of people you know these type of people from your field economics specifically and from the world of finance in in particular even even more uh particularly in the sense that these people are speculators so because they treat watches as assets because they invest so much of their money and sometimes less so of their knowledge uh, of their intellectual assets in the markets uh, they feel that they need to become active players and and speculate on the market yes. by becoming talking heads and and that's again that's one of the reasons why i established this platform and run it in the particular way i do because everywhere else these platforms <laughs> are either completely run by people who are only looking out for themselves because they are gray market sellers yeah um, they are dealers themselves or um such profiteers and speculators have completely overtaken or simply infiltrated the discussion on on any other live stream so when people make the statements like you uh, like you characterize you know what they're trying to do uh, yeah i they, mean they may they may or may not honestly believe in what they yeah, say, yeah, yeah. but they're clearly out there to speculate and and manipulate it's it, it doesn't matter uh, whether what they're saying is true or not they will make it happen uh, by the sheer force that they wield in terms of follower yes. numbers so we need to undercut them and i appreciate your yeah uh, your specific targeting of them but i <laughs> i just wanted to say you know we don't need to uh you know we don't need to pretend that we don't understand the game that they're playing um because you know the type from from the world of finance yeah yeah look they're leading the market in the good days they were pushing the product and exaggerating the demand on the on the downward cycle, they're exaggerating the collapse of the market. Everything is collapsing, everything is falling, 30%, 40%, 50%. There is no demand, there is oversupply, there are all these watches out there, and uh, they don't know what to do with them. You know, guess what? Whoever says that is not correct, because guess what? The switch watch industry has survived 124 crises. If I start from Vacheron, which is the oldest brand, all the way to today, small and big economic slash financial crisis. So, do you, and they have survived it by hook or by crook, by merging, acquiring, whatever. They're there. You and I will not similarly make it through such a long list of crises to overcome, right? So now it's a different story. Now the story is. Market is collapsing, oversupply, ADs don't know what to do with it. Oh my God. You know why? Because they want to undercut, they want to sell, they want to buy from you at a very low price, and then they hoard. And when the time comes, they make the 5%, 10%. Let me share one anecdote um, with I had a conversation with a, a, a very serious CEO. By serious meaning uh, one one of the top of the four brands. OK, uh, and this was back in um, uh, in January, uh, second week of January and so forth. And I, I asked I asked him uh, because, of course, it's not Odma because now it's a it's a she, the new CEO of Odma. Um, I asked him and I said, what do you make of the of the market? Monsieur, monsieur, what do you make of this? of this market. 
um, is there a, a slowness in demand? He said to me, yes, there, there is a slowness, of course. Um, and there is less demand on the heavy pieces, for sure. Unlike two years ago, three years ago, when everybody wanted to John Mayer, uh, whatever, you know, all these things, the, the heavy pieces, which they were, for the first time, very surprised that people wanted to buy day dates. Huh? Except the traditionalists who used to buy day dates, the 36 millimeter, which was a particular dial that was, you know, in production for three months and there were 200 pieces. Okay, I'm not talking about them. They, these guys will always be there. He said to me, uh, it is great what is happening because one, we couldn't accommodate for the angriness for, for the millions of upset people. We cannot produce more. Um, and secondly, it kind of stabilizes things because we know now what is the relationship between the manufacturer and the authorized dealer. And we are sifting through our authorized dealers who are doing all these nasty practices of under the table sales, behind the window, in front of the window, on top of the roof and all of that stuff. Thirdly, it's good to get the bubble settled. The bubble has burst and it's always good because that gives us predictability in our production. Not in what we're gonna do, whether we're gonna give Aussie his platinum Daytona or not, um, that 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 is a different issue, uh, just to be on the light side because we we love Aussie expat. Uh, the issue is how we can be more humane in our approach to to the consumer base, which we understand we lost touch because we were caught by surprise from 2018 onwards with the craziness. I mean, and he said to me. Mr. Professor, you know who used to call me for particular watches? And he started quoting the names of actors and actresses and singers that he used to get. And he said, let me show you um, the, the number of this actor. He called me. He wanted this, this watch. And I said to him, uh, okay, you know, when you have 50 different people calling you and they're all the best names in Hollywood, of course, who are you going to accommodate? Uh, Aussie expat and professor? No, you'll ditch them. They'll keep on buying, you know, Air Kings and Oyster Perpetuals and whatever, right? And you give it to the Hollywood star because you need to play the game because everybody else is playing the game and it's a, you know, vicious circle and everybody does it. Everybody does the, you know, the platinum goes to Mr. whatever, uh, Wahlberg and Mr. Bridge bird and whatever bird and, and all of that. So he said to me, it's good what's happening. Uh, we have seen this before. We don't expect that it's going to destroy the industry. Yes, there is softness. We see it. Everybody else sees it. But he said to me, hey, man, you know how many people are waiting to buy Patex, the exclusive ones? Um, all the billionaires of, of, of Asia are waiting. So Mr. Stern has no problem whatsoever. Oh, you know, at, at the end of the day. Did, so did you just, I, I, did you just slip the name of the CEO you were talking to? No, 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 no. I, I, I intentionally slipped the Stern, but I didn't, I didn't speak. Um, but, uh, for so sure. es essentially, I think, uh, you know, and I highlighted this and Aussie seconded your characterization as well. You're warning against going to extremes when characterizing the markets, whether it is uh, the previous cast uh, of, the, of the speculators saying like, you know, oh, it's going to the moon, you know, that this or that type model is just an investment grade asset as anything else. And nowadays you see the same actors perhaps finally admitting to the downturn. The uh, watch to, market to the, is destroyed. To the, the watch yeah, market the is over. So that they, the can, watch... buy the, so that they can buy the dip, uh, basically. Of course. Yeah, no, of course. The, no the, the, uh, it's, a, it's a kind of short selling, 
which Ozzy understands very well, that it's it's done in public markets, in stocks. They're short selling the market. They're telling everybody, oh, not to lose. And, and you see it in the platforms. They're, they're doing it because there will be this odd guy who comes in with a 5711 and say, oh, you know, how much is it? Oh, you know, Mr. Beautiful, it's only now 89,000. But this watch was 300. No, you see all these charts? Oh, my God, it's indexed. Yeah, and they're all manipulating the index. And it's now 89. So just to just to summarize uh, these these points uh, at the end of our broadcast, because we are uh, coming to the end, since I don't want to take too much of your time, we can say that maybe such retail price include uh, increases that have become customary uh, even for multiple times a year uh, from the brands will subside yes um, i i i will be highly pressed and astonished if omega this year uh does anything close to what they did in 22. there is yeah. no way they they understand that because now they're pricing themselves completely out of the market i mean they're producing a watch which in effect its cost of production is 400 to 600 euros and they're and they're selling it for 8000 and now yeah. you know they're producing the wide dial great there will be 20 30 40000 people who buy it that's all but now there is a point where and rolex understands this understands it's this. always funny professor i i have a hard time getting you to talk at the beginning of the broadcast where we have to catch people's uh, attention and yeah. i try to conclude and and you go on these oh, hour-long yes. lectures about Rolex and Omega again. So we yeah, said, but, uh, yeah, we said retail going. prices are perhaps not going to increase as much as they did more recently in 2024. And <laughs> the secondary market will continue to soften. But I think the significant part of the downturn has already happened. The prices, yes. as people I love so. to say, have largely corrected. I but think I so. think overall they will continue to uh, decrease and and dip over the course of the year. Would you agree with that statement, or do you think things have stabilized and might even start to pick up perhaps towards the end of the year? What do you think? I would really like to hear more. Okay, I mean th this is so. This is the economist speaking. And I will give you the economist response, and then we'll say something about the watch observer so the economist will say that um interest rates will remain relatively high uh, at least for the foreseeable future unless the u.s economy goes into a recession which seems still unlikely uh, we could see a, a let's say a correction not a crash but a significant correction in U.S. equities because there is a frenzy. Okay, they have gone up too much, and um, P ratios are a little bit out of whack. Price to earnings and so forth, and inflation is still of concern. Now, with all this, it seems that the labor market in the U.S. Again, I'm talking about the U.S. because the U.S. is the most important. Uh, nobody gives a shit about Thailand and Japan. I mean, they they can go to hell, but the U.S. is the most important. I'm sorry to say. And the UK eventually should realize that that they are idiots and they need to rejoin in the next 50 years, the EU. But because they're idiotic, they're not going to do it. Um, and they will live in their own kind of broth of, of, uh, of uh, idiotic behavior. Anyway, um, um, I, I think that the market will begin if we don't have a crash in the US or a significant correction and the labor market doesn't soften more because it is beginning to soften up a little bit if we don't have these things probably at the end of 24 things could begin to pick up but i expect that prices will go down now there is another thing uh what has to do with gray market supply and demand uh young brando 
which is that if in economics, I mean, I can show you charts, if in economics um, you have the end of supply, so right now a market, the gray market is going down because there is supply, underlying supply, which is either being furnished uh, from existing watches or it is there because of previous purchases and either they accumulated the watches or some people have sold them or they're selling them. At some point, that inventory will come to an end when the demand picks up. So, and if they're not picking it up from the ADs, there will be a return back to the AD. You see what I mean? So right now you're seeing all the watches in the gray market that are falling significantly are watches that have been produced in 21, 22, 20, 23. Occasionally you see the 24, but there is a lot of inventory. Once that inventory goes, then the gray marketeer will have to go and say, okay, where do I pick my new inventory? Because I run out of watches. That's the point when prices will begin to significantly not rise, but there will be a return to the uptrend, whether it is two or five or six percent upturn, I don't know, on an annual basis or by, you know, every two years or three years. What, and I'll, and I'll finish with this. Um, what we've seen and, and, before. And do you think, ju just to clarify it in my own mind as well, do you think that process will unfold over the course of this year or later? What we don't know is the amount of inventory out there by the great marketeers. So when you see yellow gold submariners, white gold submariners going for anything between twenty six to twenty nine thousand dollars, right? And these were purchased in twenty one, twenty two, twenty. You know, occasionally you see the twenty three. It seems that we're still having a lot of inventory, so they're getting rid of the twenty one <laughs> inventory. We're right. not yet there. Once you see watches at the same price being sold and they're kind of brand new, 23, 24, that's when the signal for you is that, okay, they're running out of the inventory. Huh? I think that is really the kind of unmathematical uh, way of explaining what is happening without having data points. I mean, I'm talking out of thin air because there are no data points on what is the supply in the gray market. We know what is happening at the AD level. You know, we, we know how many watches Rolex, Cartier, AP, Patek produce. Um, and then we know what is happening. We don't know what is happening in the gray market. So my expectation is that you will, st you will still see um, um, this, this market going down, but not significantly, you know, um, what, the the worst is kind of behind us unless we go into a massive you know economic meltdown collapse and 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 so forth right now the other unusual thing is um crypto is beginning to reach uh frenziness um for whatever reason you know it, there is the technical reason that there are these splits that are happening and now the etfs and they're treated now as an asset an investment, right? Um, and and that could feed into the liquidity, uh, but we're not similarly to where we were in 2020 during the COVID years. And I wanted to say this, and I'll finish with this. I don't think the watch market will ever return back to the craziness of the COVID era. It, it is over. If you people think that the Daytona is gonna be 50,000 that you're holding uh, in the next five years, um, I, I think that it, it is a fallacy. It, it is kind of, you know, uh, a, ver a very difficult thing to expect. All right. With, with that being said, I really appreciate, Professor, your time and the knowledge and the insights you always share with us and uh, your patience with my antics uh, and sometimes... Um, you know, intrusive uh, acts of, of, of humor. So uh, I really appreciate you. Thank you. Um, I would like to see you again uh, at some point on the, you know, tapering end of the live streams as Europe starts to wake up. 
uh, when I do my nightly show. Unfortunately, there's not one tonight, uh, but I have, in fact, um, a shorter video that's premiering in a couple of minutes. So I will invite people to watch that. I will just provide the link in the chat right here. Um, feel free to hit the like button before you jump off, before you go on <laughs> with your day or, or uh, before you watch the next video. I really appreciate your presence and support. Uh, if you want to otherwise contribute to the channel, you know how, through uh, YouTube uh, and through the links that I provided in the description. Memovox, who is a member of the channel, was already so generous. And at the last gasp, Corrado Galizia uh, also generously contributed $4.99 in US dollars. I really appreciate it. As you guys know, uh, this is a channel that is completely independent. Uh, so your contributions are vital and they do come back to you immediately in terms of quality content, such as this episode we are <clears throat> concluding now. So hit the like for the professor. Feel free to leave your comments down below. They're always appreciated and they help us also bring further attention onto our videos and onto our content. And we will see you in the next one. Stay safe, stay healthy, and wear the damn thing. Enjoy it. We'll see you on the next one.